Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another session of Room for Discussion. Today, we will be talking about Google. Google, to put it mildly, is the company of the future. Whether it's its iconic search engine, the development of anything from smart glasses to driverless cars, or its multicolored logo, it has quite literally become an integral part of our life. However, this rapid technological renewal has also brought about a lot of criticism from political pundits to business competitors to just regular citizens. Um, our guest today is Professor Hal Varian, Chief Economist of Google. Um, along with Mr. Varian today, we will be discussing how Google and big tech is shaping our society and the global economy, um, as well as whether Google is living up to the ideas which it has been projecting. So without further ado, please give a warm round of applause to Mr. Varian. Welcome, Thank welcome, you. welcome. Thank you. Well, Mr. Varian, one of the first questions that came to us after we announced your arrival at the university uh, was, why does Google need a chief economist? So could you explain that to us? Why does Google need a chief economist? Well, first of all, every company needs a chief economist. So uh, it's just... Do they uh, all have one, though? <laughs> not yet. That's, <laughs> what, uh, you, that's what they're waiting for you to graduate, I think. I see. <laughs> Um, okay, so about five years ago, I got a phone call from another big tech company. They said, oh, Dr. Varian, we're thinking about hiring a chief economist. Tell me, what exactly do you do? <laughs> so it's a good question. Not, uh, the answer is not widely known. But back in 2002, I um, ran into Eric Schmidt, who said, I just joined this cute little company down in the South Bay, we have about uh, 300 people. And uh, why don't you come down, spend a year with us, and help us out on some of these problems we're facing? This was Google. This was Google, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the first problem I looked at, Eric said, why don't you take a look at this ad auction? I think it might make a little money. So I looked at the ad auction, and as you know, economists study market design, auction design, this kind of thing. And uh, it was a very clever auction, I thought. It must be in the literature somewhere. I went and went through all the uh, literature on auctions, and it wasn't there. So I had to build my own model of this and build up a model of the auction, and that auction, that model was... Uh, like online auctions? Is that yeah, what you're Yeah, this to? was an online auction, and it was used to, to sell ads, to price ads. So that was the AdWords auction. Then we had the AdSense auction. Then when we went public, we went public using an auction. We had Spectrum auctions. We had top-level domain name auctions. What else? I'm missing one. Ah, <laughs> patent auctions. All right. So all of that work in auction design, market design, mechanism design, that's very been very, very helpful to Google and other companies in, uh, in this area. Apart from auctions, how has you know, economics brought value to Google? Right. So about, uh, well, last year we had a uh, summit at Google on forecasting. Turns out there were 23 different teams at Google that were doing forecasting, <laughs> and none of them knew the other teams. So yeah. that's a common problem in economics. You're trying to do forecasting, not so much forecasting in the macro economy, that we leave that to others, but looking at our own sales, revenue, geographic um, increases, decreases, and so on. Uh, it's really a kind of econometrics. So we have about 300 statisticians at Google that we've hired over the years that are doing this kind of analytic work, uh, utilizing data to solve problems. But looking at, at revenue costs, mm -hmm. but what about general macroeconomic tre trends? Do you also look at those? We do definitely look at those, but I will say we tend to be consumers of that information rather right. than producers. All right. So actually, by, while researching uh, for this uh, interview, we found an interesting paper that you wrote in in 1989 mm -hmm. on uh, economics as a policy science. Mm -hmm. And if I might quote wow. you from that uh, paper, you say, mentioning, uh, talking about economics, you say, I think Keynes was only half joking when he said that economists should be more like dentists. Right. The methodological premise of dentistry and economics is similar. We value what is useful. Mm -hmm. Do you believe then that economics in the private world is more useful than economics in academia? 
or or not? More useful. More useful. I, no, no, I, I, I'm not just asking a question, what does more useful mean in this context? Economics in the private sector is absolutely useful. I completely agree with that, and you mm -hmm. can see it by looking at the tech companies. Amazon has 120 economists they've hired in the last uh, two years. Microsoft just hired one of my best people away, <laughs> so I was very <laughs> sad to see that, but uh, it's a very, very active market, uh, particularly in the technology area. And when we look at new innovations like autonomous cars, obviously those raise a lot of economic issues mm -hmm. for the, they're going to impact our lives in a multitude of ways. And it's very good idea to have some economists around looking at these mm -hmm. issues. But in terms of, uh, because you were talking in here about uh, economic theory, mm -hmm. do you think economic theory, the testing grounds for economic theory, is that better done in academia or in, in uh, the private world itself? Well, both. We have a very active interchange going on between academicians and people in the industry. We have uh, two workshops per year, one in the summer, one in the uh, uh, winter, where these groups get together and describe the kind of work they're doing to, to each other. So it's, it's quite a bit of back and forth going on in this area. Between academia and the Academia private and industry. Yeah. Well, one distinction w maybe w which I may suggest between academia and the private sector is that in the private sector you strive to create value and mm -hmm. profit, whereas in academia it's more of a strive for truth. Do yeah. you see a kind of contradiction between these two occupations? No, not at all. No. I would say they're both after an understanding. We want to understand these economic forces at work. Uh, let me give an example. So there's been talk in uh, Europe recently of a digital services tax. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's a question, where's the incidence of this tax? Who is going to end up paying it? Because as we all know, everyone who studied economics uh, recognizes that the ultimate incidence of the tax could be very different than the initial impact. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's an economic question, very classical economic yeah. question, mm -hmm. covered in all of the textbooks. But I have to say the uh, understanding of that issue outside of economics is very limited. Uh, people don't even recognize the question that you need to pose. So the important thing is to ask the right questions. Once you ask the right questions, in many cases, the answer presents itself quite directly. Mm -hmm. So you need to be an economist first before joining a major company or else you're not really contributing much. Of course. <laughs> 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 but in terms of uh, your you, you did work for quite some time right. in, in an academic institution, and like the ethical <laughs> conceptions of an academic institution are different from that of a corporation. You didn't have trouble adapting at all to this different environment? No, not at all, really, because the questions were questions that were of general interest, uh, typically. And, of course, I had been studying the information economy for several years before joining Google. In fact, I was at the University of Michigan for several years, and an interesting fact that no one seems to remember now is the internet was run by the University of Michigan, the global internet. Well, uh, what, what year was this again? This would have been 1994, 1993. Uh, what happened is the National Science Foundation funded the development of the NSFnet, it was called then, which connected together research ins institutions in the US and around the world. And they needed someone to run that. And it turns out the University of Michigan submitted the lowest bid and uh, had uh, high quality service. So it was all managed from that particular uh, location. All right, so let's now discuss, to, uh, discuss some of the trends that you as a chief economist look at uh, while working in Google. And mm -hmm. one of those trends has been this concept uh, that has been discussed in the World Economic Forum uh, uh, this year, uh, last year, I believe, or this year, and is this idea of the fourth industrial re revolution or Industry 4.0. Mm -hmm. So could you explain what that means to you? What does that mean to Google mm -hmm. uh, briefly? Well... Is it even uh, possible? I, I'm not sure I know what it means, and therefore I can't be very brief. Uh -huh. <laughs> but. I think they just mean, here's this new technology that's come along that's had a, going to have a big impact on the and world. And this new technology is? Is uh, internet and uh, digital, uh, digital process of one sort or another. 
Uh, Bill Nordhaus, who just got the Nobel Prize in economics uh, last year, I think, uh, did a study, found that there was a trillion-fold decrease in the cost of computation. So it's j hugely productive, an absolutely dra dramatic change in just, what, maybe since, let's say, World War II, so maybe 50 years, 70 years, something like that. Uh, so that um, change has had dramatic repercussions. We now carry around in our pockets a computer that's more powerful than the computers that yeah. manned the trip to the moon. So it's an incredible change, and obviously it's impacting our lives but in many ways. But is it all optimistic in your view? Well, is it all no, positive? I mean, every, every change has its pluses and minuses. If you look at the first three industrial revolutions, you could say the same thing. Overall, I think everyone would have to agree it's had a positive effect on human welfare, and I have every reason to believe that will be true in this uh, revolution as well. But there will be negatives, of course. So essentially, this rule that you have, the Varian rule, yes. do you think it's going to apply uh, for the fourth industrial It's going to apply in the fourth industrial revolution still. Yeah, absolutely. Because you think about it now, even the smallest company has access to communication and computation infrastructure that the largest multinational mm -hmm. uh, could barely afford 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, same thing with individuals, you have this access to very, very inexpensive communication, digital uh, data uh, analysis. So that ha is going to have a big effect on everybody. All on the everybody, way through. Yeah. including the consumers. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I think the variant rule does seem to apply quite well to for consumer goods. Uh, this idea for the audience that uh, members that do not uh, know what it is, essentially is this way of predicting the future in which the, what the rich people have nowadays, mm -hmm. in 10 years or in 20 years, the poor people will have. So for example, iPhones right. or computers, right? But there's other trends that I think are worrying, uh, worrying people, including uh, the youth. For example, wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. And uh, the recent report in 2018 by uh, Piketty and others shows that, uh, well, the top 10% owns more than 70% of the total wealth in China, Europe, and the United States. And if the trend continues, we'll see that the 0.1% alone will own more wealth than the global middle class by 2050. So what do you think about this trend? Is the fourth industrial revolution going to make it even worse, or can we uh, reverse it? So when these revolutions came along, the first industrial revolution, the second and third, all of these uh, forces, you saw the same effect of the people who were in there early, who mastered the use of the technology, who were able to put it to high-valued applications, did extremely well during that, uh, during that period, and we're seeing that now, but I think we will uh, end up with a situation where the benefits of these technologies are spread throughout society. So my, I, I, I think you have to, w when you take a historical perspective and you mm -hmm. look at what happened in these other cases, we just see the same story happening now. But you think it, so this idea that this time is different, you don't believe it? I don't believe it. You don't believe it? No. But in terms of wealth inequality, how yeah. exactly can the fourth industrial revolution or can we tackle uh, this trend? Well, remember, when you look at what's happening in the developed countries, you're seeing uh, changes now that were almost inconceivable 70 or 80 years ago. Um, I cite as an expert here my grandfather, who was a farmer in Ohio. He was born in 1900, and he said, I l when I was born, people got around on horse and buggy, and now men have walked on the moon. And that was a 70-year period, 70 years, from 1900 to 1969. Yeah. Uh, we saw this incredible burst of, of uh, progress, and we saw technologies being disseminated widely that uh, improved people's lives dramatically. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the prevailing worries is, of course, automation, that yeah. the, the creation of all these new technologies would leave a lot of people jobless. And you've claimed that automation is necessary. Why do you think that's the case? Well, remember, the automation is producing uh, more products for people to consume, and somebody has to be there to buy those products. So I don't think automation is going to make 
people's lives worse off, it's going to make people's lives better off. We do need a government response, that is, would expect to see redistribution taking place, education, training for new jobs, But what do you job mean by sharing. being necessary? Well, to realize the full benefits uh, of mm -hmm. these technologies, yeah. If, it, if it's just, uh, if its only purpose is to make a few people rich, that's not really mm -hmm. <laughs> very valuable from yeah. this a social point of view. Because at the moment we are still seeing some of the effects of the previous industrial revolutions. For example, in Ohio actually, mm -hmm. um, some 750,000 manufacturing jobs have been lost since the late 60s. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of these jobs have not been able to, uh, have not been compensated for, they've not been able to transition into the economy properly. So what makes you think that the digital revolution this time will have a better transition effect for these jobs? Well, there's a couple of things because the jobs that were lost in Ohio and Michigan were mm -hmm. actually gained in Tennessee and Kentucky because a lot of the manufacturing in the U.S. has moved south mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, some of which involve unions, some of which involve climate, some of which involve supply chains and so on. So there's been a big impact with some states doing very, very well and other states losing uh, workers. So I would say that uh, generally, overall, even within these impacted states, there's still industries, let's say, that are doing quite well. So mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. One is medicine and health. Right. One of the most important facts in understanding what's going on in developed countries now is the demographic effect. All developed countries are getting older, mm -hmm. including yeah. the Netherlands, including uh, the U.S., Germany, mm -hmm. even more so Italy, huge change there. And so there's uh, a lot of growth in health and medical care. Mm -hmm. and that's certainly true in, in Ohio and Michigan. So these manufacturers will become healthcare providers? Is that what I you're saying? I think that the, the if you look at the regional impact, the role of uh, healthcare medicine is going to only increase. Mm -hmm. And there are places like the Cleveland Clinic, the Ann Arbor Clinic, Mayo Clinic, all of these places in the northern part of the U.S. that are providing the employment and economic background mm -hmm. for the areas. So you said that the government should play a role to smooth out the transition. Um, is Google, for example, willing to uh, help retrain workers and get them more adjusted into this economy? Right. So we have several programs mm -hmm. that do exactly that. Uh, retraining workers, uh, helping small businesses get online. One thing that we've been doing that we didn't exactly plan, but turned out to be very important, is uh, the role of YouTube in the educational system. Mm. Every, every day, every day, there are one billion views of how-to videos on YouTube. That might be how to solve a quadratic, quadratic equation, or how to play the piano, or how to weld, or how to... But do you think that can really replace face-to-face -face training? Well, I think the question is not whether it can replace it, but whether it can be an effective supplement to face-to-face okay. mm. -face training. I have a friend whose hobby is welding. Now, welding is a skilled craft. It's got a premium in the labor market. He says YouTube has fantastic videos on how to weld. So certainly you can utilize that kind of material in a way that helps people learn new skills. Mm -hmm. Same thing with cooking as an example, or many other carpentry, several other skills of this sort. Mm -hmm. We've never had a global access to instructional materials uh, in, in all of history. And now basically everyone in the world mm -hmm. that has access to a mobile phone has access to this instructional content. So that's a big piece right there. It's not going to do the job just by itself, but it helps solve access. So mm -hmm. we still need teachers. Absolutely, absolutely. And the teachers provide not just instruction, but they provide motivation, coaching, helping, encouragement, lots of other things that are mm -hmm. softer skills that you're not going to get through the video. But you put the two together, the human factor and the instructional content, I think you can really make have a big impact. Mm -hmm. So beyond what you mentioned, for example, cl clinic jobs and things like that, what sort of jobs do we need in the future? What sort of jobs will really peak and be the most important to the economy in the future? Well, I have written on this before. About 10 years ago, I said the sexy job of the next decade is statistician. Statist 
And now the statisticians are all telling me, well, what's going to happen next decade? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty good data scientist, pretty no. good forecast for that time. Yeah, and so everybody is studying data science now. And I think that uh, it is going to be uh, an important and useful career because we're generating so much data. The challenge is in extracting the information from that data, being able to recognize what's going on, understand the phenomenon in question, manage it. We'll see a lot of that. Uh, that's going to continue to be an important area. And you area. think that educational institutions are doing the proper job, creating those skills, well, furthering those skills yep. in the labor market? So they're doing a great job at that. And in fact, the uh, most important fact is a wealth of instructional material that's available online. So if you wanted to acquire some of these skills, a new university isn't offering it this semester, or or uh, you want to get a taste of it, you can get uh, excellent instructional material online and from your university All right. simultaneously. I think it's it's interesting that you mentioned those high skill workers because uh, definitely uh, like one of the foundational assumptions of a, 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 a technological progress is that technological progress complements highly educated workers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. increases their demand for them. But what about non-highly educated workers. Right. I think David Alter has done some excellent studies on this, showing how the, the I mean, not the wor the job places for these non-college educated workers is, has been really diminishing because right. of technology. So is there a future for them? Well, really, if you look closely at Alter's work, it's, it's a little bit more subtle than that because, yes, you're seeing a growth in wages for the high end, yeah. You're seeing a growth at the low end, at unskilled workers, people who are, let's say, doing uh, uh, work in restaurants, food service, gardeners, that kind of thing. As well. As well, but it's the people in the middle where you're seeing the biggest problem, because if your job involves copying a number from one spreadsheet to the other spreadsheet, there's not going to be much of a future in that kind of work, because computers can take over this very... Um, repetitive task, whether they're manual or whether they're cognitive, yeah. either, either mm -hmm. side. So it's this question of that, the, that middle, mid-range skills where you really need the uh, instructional material. I want to come back to the demographics because I All think right. that's very, very important. In most developed countries now, the workforce is declining relative to the population. Yeah. In the U.S., what's happening is the population is growing twice as fast as the labor force, okay? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the figures are in the Netherlands, but I think the same phenomenon is taking place. So even rather low-end jobs, I think, are going to see an increase in demand. Mm -hmm. During the 20th century, we had this relatively unique phenomenon where we had two big shocks to the labor market, both occurring in the 60s and 70s. One of those was baby boomers. So all the baby yeah. boomers were coming into the labor market during that period. Mm -hmm. And also the uh, dramatically increased female participation rate in the labor market, which also occurred during the 60s and 70s. So for much of that century, it was pretty easy to find workers. When it's easy to find workers, you're going to expect a relatively low wage. As it gets harder and harder to find workers, then you'd expect to see wages going up. So and we're beginning to see that now. So there's definitely going to be jobs for these people. Yep. But Traditionally speaking, uh, let's say yeah, after World War II, one of the ideas was that non-college educated workers could still uh, be employed in, in those middle-skilled yep. uh, uh, work uh, uh, works jobs, yep. right? And these middle-skilled jobs were the ones that would then uh, allow them to, you know, uh, uh, accure wealth and then become richer and then give better opportunities for their children. Mm -hmm. But we, are, as you mentioned, we're seeing those opportunities diminish. Mm -hmm. So do non-college workers, are they just going to have the lower end of the job distribution or can they actually, w is there any way that we can get them to also become part of the middle class later on? Right. Well, there is this question, who is it that does those low-skill jobs? Somebody has to do them. Yeah. Well. And uh, they're too complicated for robots because robots work fine in assembly lines where it's a very controlled environment and you have one thing done in one place. Robots can do those sorts of, uh, of assembly level jobs, but, but it's very, very hard to do jobs involve several 
different skills. So even a low-end job, think about your uh, chambermaid in a hotel, for mm -hmm. example. It's a very heterogeneous environment. It requires uh, doing a number of different things. There's still going to be a need for, for these people. Where do they come from? They could come from immigration, but we know immigration has a lot of challenges too yeah. from the political and economic side, so it's not clear, clear that that solves the problem. I think what will happen is you will see wages increase because wages will increase because of the shortage of, uh, right. of labor. Mm -hmm. yeah. But for example, one thing about also the productivity gains that you mentioned at the beginning, um, a lot of these have been accruing just to the top 5% of firms, what they've called superstar firms, mm -hmm. and with basically the rest of the industry lagging behind. Isn't this something that's worrying for you? Yeah, absolutely. When you look at it, it's not just the superstar firms, but mm -hmm. at the other end, there's the zombie firms, yeah. the walking dead, who are actually not sufficiently uh, efficient to survive, but are being supported for political reasons. We see this in China, of course, yeah. with the state-owned enterprise. We see this in Europe, with it, particularly in countries that have very restrictive labor law. We see it in the U.S. It's pretty much a universal, universal mm -hmm. phenomenon that there are cases where at the high end you're seeing highly productive enterprises, at the low end you're seeing the walking, the, the zombie firms, mm -hmm. and clearly you would like to shift resources from the inefficient uses to the more efficient uses. And you don't think and that the, the industrial, the fourth industrial revolution will just expand this gap between the, l the lower performing um, firms and the top ones? Well, it's, it's a question that I, I don't think it's so much an economic question. It's mm market forces would move resources from inefficient uses to efficient uses, but there's going to be a lot of resistance to that from the political side. I mean, right now, how long ago was it? 10, well, 15 years maybe, Germany was the sick man of Europe. Yeah. You remember <laughs> this period? Then, of course, they were forced <laughs> to make their labor markets more efficient, uh, which was very painful at the time but ended up in the long run being very effective. And, and I think several countries in Europe are facing the same problem where they've got a inflexible labor market, but it's politically difficult to, to fix that. But you would tie this productivity divergence to labor market, not fli no, flex no flexibility in the labor market? Well, what, I, what I'm saying is you brought up this issue yeah. of the divergence in productivity mm -hmm. within industries, which is absolutely apparent. The, we know what that means, move resources from inefficient uses to more efficient uses. And I think the, uh, I, I think that people can be question. educated to take advantage of that new technology, but there's a lot of resistance from, from politics, political side. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, maybe at this point we can have an audience question. Anyone Is with some cool? questions? Or maybe two? Yes. Uh, there. There's a mic, yeah. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Pushpika. I'm an assistant professor at the business school here at the University of Amsterdam. Um, so many of the ideas that you developed, including um, computer-mediated um, transactions, uh, data oh. extraction, ad auctioning, all these ideas have been paramount to the growth of Google, right? Mm -hmm. So now we are at a stage where Google is a very dominant player, right? It's, it's a monopoly in many of the industries. Together with Facebook, it could be considered a duopoly when it comes to online advertising. So looking at this, I mean, how do you reflect on this? And not as a worker of Google, but as an economist. So what we learn basic economic theory is that free markets are good um, and it leads to the maximization of, of social welfare because there's you know enough competition and here we have a situation where there's no competition anymore right google is is is, an, is the biggest player when it comes to data and, and behavioral predictions so where does this go are we still maximizing social welfare here Okay, so I, I ag absolutely agree with your statement that competition is a good thing for economic efficiency. All right. But the point where I disagree, <laughs> or, or challenge your, your uh, predicate there a little bit, is this issue uh, that there's not competition in the digital world. Because if you look at Google, remember only 6% of the clicks are ad clicks, where all the revenue comes from, and 94% of the clicks are organic 
clicks. And there is huge competition for those commercial clicks. For example, now in the US, a majority of shopping visits to the internet start on Amazon, not on Google. And if you look at things like Travelocity or Dutch company Bookings.com, they're competing very heavily to get people to navigate directly to their site and do their travel planning on that site. Same thing for local search, same thing for all other sorts of, of search. If you look at the general purpose search that Google is doing, uh, it's a tough business because you only get to sell 6% of what you produce because only 6% of those queries actually end up making money because of the ad clicks. And if you look at Microsoft, they're competing with that. Amazon is competing with it. Apple is competing with Google and the mobile phones. Recently, what now, two years ago, Amazon came out with the smart speaker. Nine months later, Google, Google. comes out with its smart speaker. There's an intense competition going on there. So all the way along, these companies are competing with each other, and it's that competition that generates the rapid innovation and the dramatic reduction in cost that we see on the technology side. So absolutely, competition, a very important force, but competition is more active in the online world than almost anywhere else in the economy. All right, uh, we have time for one more question. Yeah, the gentleman, gentleman over, over there. there. Uh, thank you so much for coming here. Uh, my question is about 5G. Uh, Trump in February said that companies in US should roll out 5G as quickly as possible. And in the community, there are some concerns about health problems and privacy problems which come with the implementation of this technology. So my question to you is, uh, what is the end goal of this technology? Because the telecommunication companies are just the implementers of the technology, but the actual uh, uses of them are going are to be made by companies like Google and Amazon. So what is the end goal? Because I couldn't find like any uses for the technology. We know that it's going to give us 30 gigabytes for se per second of speed, but what do we need that for? Right. Thank you. End goal of 5G. Yeah, good question. So you should think of 5G as a blend between cellular 4G technology and Wi-Fi. So the idea is you would have uh, stations that have small cells, uh, for example, a building or maybe a city block where you have low power, very uh, rapid speed, but you need many of these antenna, and the antenna are, of course, much smaller than the cellular antenna, just small and intrusive things that can provide you with this high-speed uh, service. So there's lots of questions about how this will be used. One issue is, of course, autonomous vehicles. Earlier, before the meeting started, we had a long uh, discussion about this. I mentioned that we would have driverless cars now if it weren't for those darn humans. Because the challenge in a driverless car is it's easy for them to coordinate with each other, but uh, it's almost impossible to coordinate with the other drivers and the pedestrians, right? So having this high-speed communication network that's available throughout the city is going to make it much, much easier to do this kind of, uh, of logistics uh, for both products and people. So you could imagine if you controlled the flow of traffic, or at least provided information which allowed the flow of traffic to uh, be optimized, how much more efficient cities would become. So that's one of the promises of 5G technology, right. because the Wi-Fi doesn't do it now, and the cellular doesn't have the bandwidth, so having something in between could make a big difference. Yep. Thank you for your questions. We're going to have time for audience questions later on in the interview. I want to move on now to data, uh, because as a uh, student of economics, I data is a bit of a different sort of commodity from what uh, I'm, I'm used to it. And from like a, a research we read, people comparing data to the new, as the new oil, uh, referring to its uh, value. Uh, what, what do you think of this idea? Is, is data the new oil? How, what, what's the difference? Uh, how, how are they similar? Right, so they're like in one respect. That is, they both have to be refined in order to be useful. Right. Both the data and the, and the, and the, uh, the oil. 
So when we look at uh, goods as economists, we have these concepts of goods that are non-rival. So you and I, can, we can only consume, well, if there's a candy bar, you can have it or I can have it, but we can't yeah. both consume it. Whereas if there's data, you and I can both consume the same data. Or, uh, and then we have this issue of excludability. So sometimes the data is excludable due to it, it, uh, it, property rights, uh, uh, intellectual property, yeah. trade secrets, whatever. Sometimes it's not excludable. It's pretty much available to uh, to everyone. So uh, those are in economics, those are called club goods. It's like a swimming club or tennis club, but inf information and data have the same uh, the same characteristic. So I think it's, for example, not a good idea to talk about who owns the data because you and I can easily own the same data. If you take a photograph of the two of us, mm -hmm. uh, we, right. both, uh, we both have that. You can talk about who controls the data, what kind of contractual uh, relationships can develop, how the data could be managed, what are the rules and regulations in terms of access to that data. But you don't really want to make it as simplistic as ownership, which works just fine for candy bars and uh, private goods. But with data and information, you have a lot broader set of possibilities. And we're, you know, we so it's more about access to data, right? Mu than much more about data. access and use right. and restrictions. All of those, the, all those issues are, are critical issues. So the simple example, health data, medical data. I mentioned earlier, because of this aging that's going on in developed countries, health and, med and medicine are getting more and more uh, expenditure, more and more interest and how do you manage health data? Because there's a public interest, very strong public interest in making this data easily available for analysis. At the same time, there's a private interest in being able to control and manage the data. So those policies right. will have to be worked out. We don't have off-the-shelf solutions to them at this, uh, at this point. When we think about this data is like oil, well, at Google, we tend to think the data is more like sunshine. It's <laughs> available to everyone. Maybe not so much in the Netherlands, but in California, <laughs> we think of it as being available to everyone. And, uh, and then uh, the question is, what are the rules for sharing data? What are, the, what are the requirements? What are the options? Lots of questions come up about those, uh, yeah. those issues. Before those questions, I do want to address some characteristics of data mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a commodity, as, a, as an asset. And it's, for example, increasing returns of scale. So you have a, a service, essentially, right, that compiles data from uh, a user. Mm -hmm. But then because the service or the product is good, more users come, and therefore more information uh, is uh, accumulated, and therefore the product is even better. And to this, actually, this is the, this positive feedback you actually discussed it in your book about information economics, mm -hmm. and you said, this positive feedback makes the strong get stronger and the weak get weaker, leading to extreme outcomes. Mm -hmm. So does data just simply change the rules of, of competition? Should we just see competition differently because data has this characteristic? So I think that what happens there is uh, it's true that data is valuable. When it's refined, it's not just the raw data, of course, but it's the analysis of that data that leads to the knowledge, that leads and to the, the implementation that yeah, makes it more useful. So that's why data scientists are going to be in demand for, for some time. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, issue is it's true for every company, or for that matter, for every organization. Managing data at the university has made the university more efficient, and has made it more attractive, can educate larger numbers of people using online courses and so on. Look at something like uh, Starbucks or a, a, a chain like that where they've managed to collect all the data about what products are consumed at each location. They can analyze that data. They can optimize the uh, spread of products through the, that, that uh, group of stores on and on. Isn't that then a industry. problem in the long run? Because then you would have you know, those extreme outcomes forever. Well, I, I think what will happen is, if you look at these uh, companies, yes, you will see cases where somebody hits a formula that can reproduce, can be reproduced repeatedly and provides valuable services to people. 
but I don't think we're only going to get our coffee from Starbucks. I okay. think we're going to get it from a variety of, mm -hmm. of places. Another issue is that it's uh, the returns to scope. Yeah. Uh, Starbucks would only get data from coffee consumers, mm -hmm. but Google gets data not only from your Google search, but also from your Gmail, your Google Docs, your Excel sheets, YouTube comments, YouTube videos you watch, and that diversifies sources of information make your products much better. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a problem then for Google search, uh, no, uh, search engine competitors? Because right. they don't have that access to that other data. Well, if you, if you look at it, let's take something like the video side of things. Uh, you've got a lot of people now competing, competing in streaming video. You've got Netflix, obviously. You've got Amazon. You've got Google. You've got Hulu. You've got many, many different players working in that because you've got this very improved distribution mm. system. And now this has been called the golden age of television because you're seeing a lot of new content that's being produced that reaches audiences much more effectively than mm -hmm. the old form of content, which were you know, situation comedies on TV and uh, movies in the, in the theater. So there, I think there's unequivocally been a big improvement in access to content provided by technology and analytics mm -hmm. that support that technology. But more and more these are being you know, taken over and the market concentration is tightening more and more Google is you know, acquiring a lot of websites, a lot of apps. How exactly is this promoting competition if, if Google is really enlarging its scope, especially with regards to data and things like this? Well, remember all of these examples that I cited. It used to be, in the US at least, that most of the content, video content, came out of New York or Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Relatively small number of studios are reproducing this content, but now, first of all, the content's become much more global, mm -hmm. that you're getting content from all over the world, and uh, secondly, it's been much more creative. It's not the same thing over and over again, mm -hmm. but it's a whole variety of new content. I used to say that there's wonderful choice in the movie theater these days, you can get comic books from both Marvel and DC. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Okay. But you know, now there's so much more available. So you think that, especially in the United States, there's competition is not a problem. There's plenty of innovation going around. I, I think we're, and, and not just the United States, but if you look in, uh, in Europe, you're seeing the same thing with a lot of cooperation across Europe okay. in terms of producing content, which is, let's say, culturally relevant and at the same time can be mass entertainment. So a few, uh, a couple years ago, I was on Malta and I was talking to one of the people there who said she was a costume designer for, for uh, Game of Thrones, <laughs> which right. you know is filmed in. Mm -hmm. So she was there to inspect the armor and try to come up with new ideas for armor in Game of Thrones. But the way it's produced is really incredible because you have a castle in Croatia, a palace in the south of France, mm -hmm. uh, seaside in Northern Ireland, and you've got Iceland, the north, and they're moving the actors around constantly to each of these different sets mm -hmm. where you're now doing the filming and production in a dozen locations in Europe. That, but that you couldn't really do before. Mm -hmm. But to come back to innovation in, in the yeah. tech industry, for example, what about startups? We've seen that startups ha are now witnessing a 12-year slump um, in, America. in America, and new business formation has also reached uh, a 40-year low. What, what do you think is the reason behind this slump? Well, first of all, I was just looking at the most recent data, and 2018 was the biggest year ever for venture finance and for the number of startups. So we're actually mm -hmm. in the venture capital side of thing, we're seeing a very, very robust uh, okay. development there. And it's been increasing uh, at least since 2012. There were a couple dips okay. going on. Yeah. There was of course the big period in 2000 when you had the dot com dot bubble, com over, yeah. then it was down and then it's been coming back up. So you think the dot com bubble has a really made the, the, the curve look uh, quite sloped downwards. Well, I sure. if you go look at the, look at the data, it is, it is absolutely been increasing for the last several years. And finally, in 2018, we had 
higher investment levels than, 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 the, mm -hmm. than the dot com so bubble. So do we have then another bubble? Yeah, well, we think not because the dot com had a lot of, uh, of, of aspirations, a lot of PowerPoint went into the dot com yeah. in terms of the presentations, but I think a lot of the companies now are much more uh, viable. And you I know this has been this debate yeah. in Europe and the US about acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Well, this is nothing new. There are four times as many acquisitions in venture capital as there are IPOs. And that's been true for decades. That's not something that's new. Mm -hmm. If you try to restrict acquisitions in some way, first, I think you will lose your local innovators because they'll go to where they aren't restricted. And secondly, I think it's going to be uh, a real problem in terms of, uh, of incentives given that that acquisition is such a common way of exiting mm -hmm. uh, venture capital investments. So I'm assuming you don't look very favorably to Google's recent um, problems in Europe. It was fine for a substantial amount of money. You, d you don't think that's a <laughs> very nice thing? Well, remember, these cases are under appeal at the moment, so right. I can't, I can't okay. talk about them okay. in any uh, But you've written about them, right? I've written about them, but uh, generally, uh, the question right. will be, we, ha we haven't seen the final act yet. Right. Uh, I actually want to point out uh, some conflicting information that we got because uh, regarding, uh, well, uh, startups. Yep. Uh, for example, a Yelp CEO and, and just the business sentiment over, over venture finance and venture funding. Uh, the Yelp CEO, uh, I think one of your more corporate enemies, I would say, he, he yeah. and I quote him, he says, uh, if you provide great content in one of these categories that is lucrative to Google and you're seeing them as, as potentially threatening, and he says, uh, they'll snuff you out, they'll make you disappear, they'll bury you. And uh, as well as uh, Jonathan... Uh, so this sounds, we're back to Game of Thrones again, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> And then we have uh, Jonathan uh, Tablin, uh, as a scholar, who says uh, the very notion that someone could start a new res uh, search engine is just laughed out by the venture capital community. Um, if this is true, y you can uh, say it's not, but if this is true, is this the type of environment we want in which innovators don't even want to go compete against Google? Right. So, le so let me respond uh, in two ways. One way is if you look at artificial intelligence, uh, pretty much every one of the large companies, and for that matter, every country has been coming out with some white paper study or analysis yeah. about AI. Uh, everybody is saying we're doing AI investing. Uh, that would be the worst place for a startup to go under this theory, but there are actually 630 new companies funded in uh, 2018 that are working on artificial intelligence. This is from the Stanford uh, right. report. On the second point, the point about nobody would ever get into search. Yeah, searching. So are you familiar with Elastic? No, there, there's a couple, but... Yeah, uh, and it's a Dutch company, yeah. as you know. They went public just a few months ago, uh, worth $5 billion. The price doubled in the first uh, week. Well, their customers, in fact, are Amazon, Google, Microsoft, because they want to provide this back-office search capability to their users, so they have a standard search engine that can be used for... Um, multimedia and other kinds of documents. So this is not, a, I agree with you, it's not an area that Google is uh, dealing, but there's a certainly the alternative to provide search services that's not going to disappear or be All incorporated right. into a well, company. And Elasticsearch is a great example. They seem to be doing extraordinarily well. So you do think that there is a innovation and startups in terms of search? search engines that mm -hmm. push Google and other companies to be better because that's well, the important part, but right? But, w but we don't see Elasticsearch as a competitor. We see it as a complementer. It's providing a valuable service that cloud computing users right. will want to access. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at search as a service, not search as a product, but something that's providing search on a, uh, you know, a, a pricing system which is uh, based on volume, numbers, etc. Right. So, so it's it's got a, a different uh, business model. But on the s on the side of what Google is competing with, I'm yeah. going to come back to the monetizable searches. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of entry, a lot of activity, a lot of competition, 
in uh, helping pe people find products and services they're looking for online, okay? And you're getting that across the board from big companies and from small companies. So Google is feeling the heat from the competition? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah, absolutely. You look at it, uh, we're feeling the heat and the other companies are feeling the heat. I mean, Amazon had its quote unquote monopoly on smart speakers for nine months. <laughs> and now in comes Google with its own smart speaker and the same technology is being syndicated to refrigerators and to washing machines and to thermostats and everything else. So all of your appliances, you will communicate with them by voice in general. So now let's move on to another area in which I think Google and other big tech uh, firms are receiving quite a lot of heat, which is uh, politics. Politics, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, we've seen uh, quite recently with various scandals uh, a backlash against big tech. Do you think there's? Do you think big tech has reached its inflection point in terms of growth, in terms of uh, a positive? Uh, yeah, the, uh, people's expectation towards big tech, has it reached its inflection point, do you believe? Well, again, uh, if, if we go back and look at other technological innovations like the automobile, the automobile was a toy for rich people, and then it became to move downstream, and then people realized, wow, it's taking jobs away from blacksmiths and from horse-drawn carriages, and it's people are getting killed by automobile accidents, and now we say and it's polluting the atmosphere. So any technology comes in and people Welcome the technology, it's exciting, you see all these new possibilities, and then you start seeing some of the negative things as well. So that's always going to be true of uh, technology. With respect to politics, it's funny, uh, of course I'm mostly aware of the US situation where some of these uh, candidates for offices are saying negative things about technology. Well, plenty. Plenty of yeah. them, hmm? right? Plenty of them. Plenty of them, yeah. Of the there's, there's, a there's plenty of candidates in the U.S. at this point. Uh, but what happens is, if you look at approval ratings and trust ratings from users, technology still has about an 85% trust approval rating, and Congress has an 11% <laughs> trust <laughs> approval rating. So it seems a little strange that uh, the big, big politicians big are trying out this message. I don't think it's going to resonate with users because I mm -hmm. think that users generally value these services. But yeah. let's talk about one of those uh, candidates. Uh, I think uh, Senator uh, Elizabeth, Warren, Warren. Li Elizabeth Warren, she, uh, she oh just yes. wrote uh, uh, a medium post in which she argues that uh, yeah, the ad exchange and uh, Google ad exchange and Google search engine should be broken up. Mm -hmm. So what would that mean to Google? Well, I mean, it, it's a question. If you look at Google, its primary revenue source is still search, search advertising. Engine. That's the, the by, by far the largest source. We are also expanding into a variety of other industries. So for example, autonomous vehicles. Uh, we're putting a big emphasis on uh, YouTube, on products like phones and smart speakers, and so on. So those products are valuable because we can integrate them with what we've learned from, from search. Mm -hmm. We have, I think, it's widely recognized that, uh, that our smart speaker, for example, is much better at answering general <laughs> questions than, uh, than other people's uh, technology. So if you break it up, then you lose that synergy. You yeah. lose that fact that you can utilize what we've learned from search to make these other products better. Mm -hmm. By the way, let's take autonomous vehicles. People have said, well, why is Google doing autonomous vehicles? And the answer is, is quite uh, simple. Larry and Sergey went to see the autonomous vehicle program at Stanford, right next door, and uh, they said, gee, I wonder what would happen if you added Street View to this. Mm -hmm. They added Street View, and the performance of the autonomous vehicle increased dramatically. It was a huge step forward in terms of creating uh, truly uh, autonomous vehicles by adding that Google Maps and Google Street View mm -hmm. to it. So we're looking for things like that, where the yeah. technologies we've developed in one application can really help move things forward in another application. You break a company up, you lose those synergies. Mm -hmm. But coming back to the whole political backlash, aren't you worried that also basically both the Democrats and the Republicans, the two most divisive parties of you can find anywhere, <laughs> are uniting on this one thing which is trying to dismantle Google or trying to change Google, uh, allow right. make it more transparent and things like that. Aren't you worried about these changes? 
So I would say at this point what's happening is all of these candidates are laying out what we call planks in their platform. They're mm -hmm. trying this, they're trying that, they want to see what resonates with, with voters. Mm -hmm. So at this stage I would have to say we expect to see lots of crazy ideas mm -hmm. right. and maybe some sensible ideas too okay. coming out as people, politicians are trying them out to see how they resonate. I don't think the technology issue is really s at the top of the ordinary the voters of list. Mm -hmm. It's way down the list. Mm -hmm. But what kind of changes would you would Google be prepared to to uh, give into in terms of concessions for example increased transparency yep. and things of this nature? Well, we've already done what a number of these studies have called for, which is data portability. Mm -hmm. So we started 8 years ago with Google Takeout, so you can download any of the content that you've created on a Google. Your, your, if you have location search, you can download yeah. all of that. You can download your Gmail. You can download your, uh, your query uh, history and so on. So all of those things can be taken out of Google and they can be moved somewhere else. So we have data portability and have had it for a long time. And it seems a little strange to see these calls for data portability, data portability, when we've provi been providing it for almost a decade now. But then, for example, talking about GDPR, which is the, the, the mm -hmm. data privacy rules of the European Union, right. maybe that implemented in America, would that be a solution to these concerns that people have? If GDPR were implemented in America? Something similar, of Something course. Something similar. Yeah. So obviously there will be privacy legislation in yeah. America. My own view is we're, we are in this great situation where Europe has implemented this new piece of legislation regulation and a sensible thing to do would be to look at how that turns out, see what's <laughs> good about it, what's not good about it, what Very can be fixed. An experiment first. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a great <laughs> natural experiment yeah. uh, to you know, be the second mover. Okay. We have this saying in the U.S., you can always tell the pioneers, they're the um, ones um, with the... what's your prediction? No, the, you can always tell the pioneers, they're the ones with the arrows in their back. Mm -hmm. So, uh, not good to be a pioneer, quite good to be a second follower. And what's your prediction about GDPR? Uh, I think GDPR is going to have a lot of problems. For example, it immediately runs into this uh, data transparency, uh, data um, mobility problem that people are saying, ah, you should not only share your data with users, their data, after all, they can access it, they can delete it, they can do whatever they want with it, but also with competitors. But now, how is it that uh, one day you wake up and your email is run by a different company or your data is exported to this company because they need it to compete, but it's your personal data? So there's inherently going to be a conflict between data mobility, data transfer, and uh, privacy issues. All right. Uh, I think it's now, now is a good time to move to the audience to see if there's okay. any audience questions. The gentleman over there, I think he has Back. been raising his yeah. hand for quite some time. Thank you for... Um, I just want to follow up on the discussion of the, the nature of data and competition implications. Because I agree with you that as a user, I don't like these big uh, tech companies to be broken up because uh, that will lower the quality of my service. But as a citizen, I'm also concerned about the, the concentration of power in these companies. And so I agree that it's not feasible to break up these companies. That's 20th century policy. But we might need more innovative ways to, to foster competition. For example, Maya Schoenberger from Oxford, Uni Oxford University, an economist, suggests that we should have progressive data sharing mandates. The bigger a company is, the more of its data it needs to share because there's not only network effects, but there's also the data feedback effects that you yeah. discussed. And so with a new yeah, data economy, you might need new policy tools like that because as you say, it's not a rival good. It could work like that. And do independent of whether, I think it would obviously be, be increased the competition for Google, but the question is, do you think it would increase competition, increase welfare, such a mandate? probably wouldn't be good for Google, but do you think it would increase competition and welfare? Uh, data sharing. Yep. So I think Google has a very, very good record with respect to data sharing. So one thing, for example, is we've donated 9.5 million label images to the Open Image Project, which is used by uh, artificial intelligence researchers to improve image recognition and processing. We've donated 
donated 4.5 million uh, YouTube videos labeled to uh, to basically anybody who wants to use them. It's not just specific organizations, but anybody who wants to download this uh, data can use it for training their models. And in particular, we've, we've released uh, Google Trends, which I think has been around for almost 10 years now, which gives you an index about search activity uh, on any query that you type into Google Trends. We've been uh, working with some of the central banks and some other economic agencies that are using this data to forecast or really to now cast uh, what's going on in the economy. It's done a But what job. about, because uh, the question I think is about a government mandate for Google yeah. to share data. Well, Would you be in favor I wanted of that? to start out by saying we are sharing a lot of data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the first and most important point. And I think when you start saying sharing data at a more granular level, then you're really going to run into the privacy issues. All right. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, maybe to slowly wrap things up, we've talked a lot about political events that happened in the space of 10 years. And one thing that's clear is that um, people's kind of perception of Google and technology 10 years ago is, is different than it is right now. People in some ways are less optimistic. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about these if there wasn't some sort of public outcry. So, I mean, companies in Silicon Valley might have reason to be optimistic uh, about technology, but why should people feel optimistic about this? Well, I think one of the reasons that people do have this anxiety that mm -hmm. you describe is because they become so reliant on this uh, technology. So let me give you an example. We haven't really gotten into the privacy issue very much, yeah. but mm -hmm. I will make a, a claim. A claim is that Google's the best thing that ever happened to privacy. <laughs> wow. Why is that? Why is that? It's because people ask questions of Google that they would never ask of a person. How do I know if I'm pregnant? You know, what are the uh, symptoms of herpes? <laughs> what happens if I don't declare twenty thousand dollars worth of income? Yeah, okay. So <laughs> on and on and on. <laughs> and because they ask these rather sensitive questions, yeah. they get informed, accurate answers back from Google in almost all of these cases. And that's never been possible before. Even if you went to the library and wanted to see a particular reference book, you might uh, or take it out, your records. Uh, were there. You would never ask these questions of your mother or your father, your brother, mm -hmm. your sister, your minister, priest, tax but accountant, the whatever. The reason is because well. people w are worried about another human being able to access that. Data. Right. And, and uh, there's a nice quote from Mark Twain who said, two can keep a secret if one of them's dead. <laughs> so what happens is people are reluctant to ask these questions of other people. They're willing to ask those questions to Google because they get a good answer, and it is highly private, much safer than if you ask it to another person. But because you ask these sensitive questions, then of course people are anxious. They're worried if it turns out they might not be as secure as they had uh, thought. But believe me, they are very, very secure. I mean, these questions, humans do not get to look at these queries. The queries are generally uh, anonymized after nine months. We've got all sorts of cryptography in place to keep them secure. And uh, the, the weakness is almost always in something like choosing a stupid password or being sloppy about your personal data management. It's rarely the problem with, uh, with uh, companies. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Varian. Sadly, the interview has to come to an end. Uh, before I'm very sad to hear that. <laughs> before we give you a warm round of applause, I do want to tell the audience that uh, in a couple of weeks, Room for Discussion, uh, we're going to have an interview with Menno Snell on tax savings and tax regime in the Netherlands. So please come to that. Uh, 4th of April, right? 4th of April. Um, yeah, for now, please give a round of applause to Professor Varian. Thank you.